Hey, it's Professor Wham once again, and we are going to finish up our Project Identification Trilogy with Part 3, Phases 2 and 3, Ongoing Uncanny, A Family Affair, and Valet, that's Jacques Valet, gets it wrong. I guess some people pronounce his name Valet, however you pronounce it. So this is a lovely picture of Cape Girardeau. I believe it is at sunrise, that it, it's, so it's facing east towards Illinois. And it's from Cape Girardeau itself. Um, if you recall, I mentioned in the last installment that there were various colleagues of Dr. Rutledge who reported to him that they had actually seen strange lights over the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River at this point is pretty wide. You know, its its width varies depending on where you are, but at Cape Girardeau, it's starting, it's one of the places where the river is pretty wide. And if you recall where we left off in part two, the phenomenon had moved to Cape Girardeau. Now that doesn't mean that it wasn't being seen in other parts of South East Missouri. They were still seeing it in Piedmont. They were still seeing it um, in uh, Frederickstown. They were still seeing it in other places, but in terms of it being readily observable and easy for, for the field investigators of project identification to be able to get to it, because remember they were having lots of weather issues, um, it was easiest for them to just remain around Cape Girardeau and start observing the things that started showing up there. So essentially once Cape Girardeau became the base of project operations, it was much easier for Rutledge to assemble teams quickly and set up observer stations because he drew from a lot of the people that he knew in the Cape Girardeau academic community. And after all, he could go to be home to bed every night and so could they. So they didn't have to figure out places to, to store their equipment. They could just sort of keep their equipment ready at their own homes and, and bring it out. He also had the help of the College Astronomy Club and a number of different volunteers uh, from that club. So he was able to put together another team by June 4th, 1973. Uh, and if you remember, it was towards the end of May that they had to quit, so he didn't have to wait that long. So project members began to deploy throughout the greater Cape area to scan the skies, and this is basically the beginning of Phase 2, which will last until April of 1974. So the team first set up on Nash Road, a site which would become a favorite vantage point and is on a flat flood, flood plain about maybe two or three miles west of the Cape Girardeau Airport. It offered a complete unrestricted 360 degree view of the sky. It was also easier at this location to identify the difference between conventional and unidentified aerial lights and objects because there's very little light pollution there, or at least there was then. I'm definitely having some problems here, Mercury retrograde, retrograde with my own mouth. What is going on? <laughs> All right. At this point in the book, once phase two commences, at this point in the book, Rutledge begins talking about their subsequent experiences in more of a thematic than chronological manner. It's pretty clear, though, that he's keeping track of things. He's keeping track of all of their sightings minutely. Phase two definitely had its spectacular moments. And the first of these happened during those early observation days in June. And it was also clear then that Rutledge began to notice there was a distinct military interest in what they had been seeing in the sky. On both June 4th and June 5th, the project had identified on Nash Road several different unidentified white and amber lights in one instance, several in formation that seemed to be separated by only about an estimated 10 feet, and they viewed a number of lights each evening. 
After viewing the latter, and this was on June 5th, the airspace above them was suddenly shattered by the sound of several fighter jets apparently in hot pursuit of the lights. As the UFO display in Cape Girardeau increased in intensity, so increased the presence of military aircraft. He spends an entire chapter looking at this. Accordingly, project members spent much of their time differentiating between military and regular aircraft and unexplained lights, and I'll explain why in just a minute. He thinks it's really interesting and obvious that these lights are being pursued by military aircraft. Um, he doesn't speculate on it much, but it's very clear to him that the military has an interest in these lights. And of course, we don't know why, you know, he doesn't, he, and he's never able to determine whether they know what the lights are or whether the lights are things they've, you know, the military themselves have deployed. It's, you know, it's a mystery to him. He just describes it. Now, project observers also no noticed early on that many of the military jets they observed, including those that had that I just described, seemed very ostentatiously to not display appropriate FAA light configurations. These configurations are required even on military aircraft if they are flying within civilian airlines, particularly at lower altitudes. Obviously, Rutledge got no answers for this as he called around to the various military bases, you know, in that area of Missouri, from St. Louis to Memphis and into Tennessee. It was also during this time that some of the lights that they did see seemed to come closer to observers, almost egging them on. Some of the teams chased the lights, which would lead them on for relatively short distances and then disappear. The team did get photos during this part of phase two, but it was more difficult to do so, especially when you're chasing them. So Rutledge resorts to detailed diagrams of these pursuits in his text, although it is very clear that he also took photos, and some of the photos are reproduced in the book. Many display the same kinds of energy discharges that had been seen in the Piedmont and Farmington field observations. At one point, he got, a, he got very good information that the NORAD commander from Colorado Springs had landed for some reason in the vicinity. Although he was assured that the landing had nothing to do with the increased UFO display in southeast Missouri, he confessed he wondered about it. It just seemed too unusual. By mid-June, Rutledge was able to set up in his yard as he, he and his wife had started to see strobes around their house, and Rutledge already had enough experience to know that nocturnal lights were soon to follow. Basically, oftentimes the strobes would appear first and then lights would appear. The phenomena were literally at his doorstep. The experience that really changed everything for him permanently occurred on June 19, 1973 at 7.12 p.m. Central Daylight Time. Rutledge was in his driveway standing by his car, having just packed it in for another night in the field. Without thinking, he looked to the east and saw a bullet-shaped, dull gray object slowly making its way in the direction of the Mississippi. And if you're looking at the video, this is what he drew in figure 12.1 on the left side. Uh, that's what it looked like to him, and this is actually taken directly from, directly from his account here, if you can see the print. So it was making its way in the direction of the Mississippi. He thought at first it was a plane, but it was going too slowly, and he could see it clearly as it was still daylight. It had no wings. It was just like a dull, sort of vaguely metallic gray object, but it didn't seem to reflect light, for example. It just was sort of there. It would have been cigar-shaped had the rear end not been bluntly cut off. In short, quote, unquote, it was like nothing he had ever seen before. He decided to frame it with his fingers, 
for reaching for the binoculars on his seat. And this was so that he would have a frame of reference that so that he could sort of estimate its size later on. So he stretched out his arm and framed it between his index finger and thumb. As soon as he raised his hand to do this, the object instantly changed to a dull olive green color. Reflexively, Rutledge reached for his binoculars in the front seat, which required that he take his eyes off the object for less than two seconds. By the time he looked back up, it was gone. He frantically searched everywhere for it in the clear blue sky, and according to him, he got this weird sort of nauseated feeling in his stomach, in the pit of his stomach. It's like he had clearly seen something really unusual. He says, a slight feeling of nausea overcame me. Any doubt I had about the existence of UFOs had vanished with that object. After this experience, Rutledge began to sense that there was something significant going on, but he was never able to say exactly what, except that in his words, it was clear that there was a quote-unquote interaction playing out between the phenomenon and the observers. Blomeyer Road, closer to his home, became another common observation point, and every now and then the team would mix it up by going further afield in different directions from the Cape. And they would occasionally go back to the Piedmont area, they'd go to the Brushy Creek area. Um, it, it had a lot to do with availability. You know, if someone was available to go on a longer trip, they'd go on a longer trip. You know, if not, then he would set up in his home or he'd, he'd go to Blomeyer Field or something like that. So that's sort of how it worked after that. Now, overall, many of the sightings would follow along the main path of I-55, which, as I've mentioned, runs along the track of what was a major indigenous trading route running west of the Mississippi. Now, on July 9th, 1973, Rutledge had set up in his yard and a little after 10.30 p.m. observed a light almost overhead moving north-northeast. He stepped to where his equipment was in order to try to get his camera, and in the process tripped over the chair which held the tape recorder, keeping the light in sight the entire time. So there was like kind of this crash of noise. But it wasn't until he actually held the camera to his eyes, he managed to get it, it held it to his eyes and began focusing that the light went out. He actually saw it go out. So it's not that he reached down and looked back and it went out. It's that he reached down, picked up the camera, and focused on the object and it went out. So he, he watched it go out. A few minutes later, he watched as a plane with a very strange wing configuration flew the exact path of the earlier light. It passed directly overhead, and this is what's to your right here, the diagram that he drew of this, and he, was, he viewed this through his binoculars. It passed directly overhead, making a jet sound, but the FAA lights were incorrect, and the wings had an unusual serrated shape that he had never seen before. And he wondered, I wonder if the military has this, these weird planes with this, these weird shapes, you know, this, these weird um, wings. Additionally, light that hit the body of the craft appeared to be unevenly distributed and had a quilted appearance, and it reminded him of the sighting of an individual in the Piedmont area who had given him a report of a, of a disc-shaped object that she had seen that had a quilted appearance in the same way. And again, he wondered if the military had deployed some new kind of craft. Now, in still another instance, Rutledge set up to observe with one of his project buddies, Robert, one of the guys who'd been out with him and, and had uh, um, observed some of the unu unusual early sightings and had taken some of the early unusual photographs uh, that I talked about in the last blog. They had had a discussion earlier in the evening about reports that some UFOs seemed to undulate in motion, and they wondered why they had never seen that in the field. So this was just sort of a conversation that they had uh, before they went out. Later that night, one of the nocturnal lights appeared and looked like it was head heading parallel to the Mississippi. 
The two men were able to get some time-lapse photos of the light, but to their amazement, just as it passed beyond some trees, which would take it out of sight, it slowed down and began to undulate as it moved. For both men, it was interesting and unnerving in equal measure. And so again, if you're looking at the video, I reproduce this diagram, of uh, this undulating light, and the, and, the, and the conversation that they'd had about it. And it, it just looked like a normal light, one of those normal nocturnal lights that they couldn't identify that they were going, that they were tracking. And they did, as they said, take some photographs of it. And as you notice, just as it was going to pass beyond the tree line here to the left and just pass out of view, it's, it stopped, it, or not stopped, it slowed way down and began an undulating pattern up and down, up and down, up and down. They, they felt that it had to have been some kind of response to what they had been talking about, but what, what could that possibly mean? Now, the sightings increased into the early fall as the summer session began. Rutledge was unable to spend quite as much time in the field himself, but other members of the project continued their observations and would check back in with information and reports, which he includes in the book. Now, he has several diagrams, like the diagram to the right here. He has several diagrams like this. Um, there are a number of them, and what he's doing is detailing specific uh, chases. Uh, that's something that the project members began to do. They noticed that, that um, the objects or the lights were coming much closer to them. And in this particular instance, uh, they were actually on this road. I believe it was Nash Road. They were on this road, uh, and as you can see here, uh, coming from the right and moving up diagonally towards them, the light comes quite close to them and then very suddenly turns, because they're probably out of their car looking, very suddenly turns and begins to move away. And so they begin to, ch you know, kind of roughly parallel to the road. So they begin to chase it, and as they get right up to it, you know, right about across from it, it winks out. And this happens a lot. This is, these are actually really common chase scenarios. Um, and this is repeated many, many times. Now, by August 1973, UFO activity seemed to spread to many parts of the United States. Um, I can personally attest to this. And in fact, I, I plan to do some kind of a coda to this series where I talk a little bit about my experiences in 1973 uh, with uh, a couple of UFO experiences that I had in Kansas. And uh, my, my first um, exposure to a cattle mutilation which happened at about the same time. Um, so I can personal, personally attest to 1973 being a very active year. Now the mainstream narrative about the Piedmont UFO display implies that the flap died out by the end of the summer. But in fact, there were so many UFO reports that it became difficult for Rutledge to discern the gold, gold from the dross, as it were. So he pretty much reports only those things that he and project members directly observe, because there were so many reports in the news. Now, as the resident expert on UFOs, Rutledge often got drawn into other controversies and concerns, one of which ended up being fodder for the tabloid press, and may be well known to some of you. I mean, I remember reading about this story myself at the time, and it concerns a truck driver who, around the area in Cape Girardeau, he was driving on I-55, claimed that he had been struck in the face by some kind of light that had emanated from a bright object blocking the road in front of him. The beam had apparently melted the frames of his glasses and blinded the driver for a period of time. It was just the kind of story that the inquirer might jump on and run with it the tabloids did. I remember seeing something in the National Enquirer about it, actually. In the chapter, Physical Evidence, which um, Rutledge does have an entire chapter that is dedicated to physical evidence, Rutledge tells the whole story behind the trucker and the glasses because he 
was the scientist who was given the glasses to examine and test. Now, to explain how it was that he came to be involved in this event, Rutch, Rutledge explained that project members occasionally would go to sites where the objects or lights were said to have landed and collect physical traces to see if anything interesting or different showed up. And they did this any number of times during phase two and phase three of project identification. Rutledge had read that some scientists had explained the occasional rings left by UFOs when they landed as probably misidentified fairy ring mushrooms, a type of fungi that grows in a ring. The mycelii grow in a ring. In an ironic twist, he mentions that a few months after he first read about this, one of those very same mushroom rings grew underneath his office window at the college. I'm, I'm not even going to make any comments here about the Fae. Out of curiosity, Rutledge and other project members did travel to some locations where it was claimed that UFOs had hovered or landed leaving a ring formation behind. Project members found that some of these accounts were quite reliable. And often the team did find ring-like marks on the ground or vegetation. They always took samples, but nothing unusual was ever found. So the case of this trucker, according to this trucker, he was on I-55, and it was in the beginning of October, I think it was like October 3rd or October 5th, it was towards the beginning of October in 1973, so we were still in phase two of, of project identification. According to him, um, he, had been, he had seen a light on the road, in the middle of the road, and had stopped because it seemed to be blocking the road, and he couldn't tell what it was. He couldn't tell whether it was like emergency equipment or what it was. And he stuck his head, he said he stuck his head out of the, out of his window and was hit in the face by this blinding light. And he yelled, and um, I guess it was his wife who was in the cab with him sleeping, wife or a girlfriend, whoever, whatever person he was with. And she got up and had to, she had to drive the truck to a safe place. Um, and his eyeglasses, the, the frames were melted, and they were clearly melted, and the, uh, the lenses fell out of them. And according to him, his, he had this sort of blindness in his eyes, and, and, he, and he felt like he was burned. However, doctors who examined him could not find anything wrong with his eyes, although he disputed this. So in the case of this trucker, Rutledge was contacted to help with the investigation because the incident had occurred less than three miles from his home on I-55. There is an official report which mentions Rutledge as an investigator and can be found here. And this is from um, a, a periodic journal uh, called the Southeast Missourian that still publishes. And this was a retrospective that was done where they pulled up some stuff from their archives um, and now of course I'll put the link to this in all my descriptions uh, this is the picture of the dude the trucker himself and then it just basically describes the entire event um, what led him to this object I mean there was a little bit more to his story obviously um, he heard humming uh, he, there, was a, there was a fat fog bank that came up that caused him to slow down, um, ex lots of different things. And, and uh, then there were different types of tests that were done. Uh, so there, were, there, there was the physical tests to him, and then the eyeglasses were tested. This is actually a drawing that was done by Eddie Webb of the light that he saw. They do call it an unidentified flying object here. In, the, in his original account, it isn't clear that it's flying. He doesn't know if it's flying or, or it's sitting on the ground. Uh, but in any case, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the information so that you can look this up if you want to. I remember reading about this because um, this particular account occurred in, in, in many publications uh, and in many tabloids. So Rutledge had been given the frames, which had been bubbled and deformed by heat, 
and subjected them to various tests, chemical and otherwise. And he describes this in detail uh, in the book. Nothing unusual was found. He looked into the specifics of how the frames were made, asked an organic chemist who worked for the local law enforcement forensics team to conduct an extensive examination of them. And he found uh, this, this uh, organic chemist was able to locate some specific caustic chemicals that would have caused the same kind of damage to the eye frame to the to the glasses but he said that it would also if these glasses were actually on the guy's face it would have blinded him for sure and left terrible scarring he finally even asked some truckers if they knew anything that could do this to plastic frames such as these now several truckers told him that signal flares could do this if the frames were close to it, and told Rutledge of instances when truckers had damaged eyeglasses while putting out flares around their stopped vehicles. And of course, these are the flares, if you're familiar with them, that truckers will put out in order to warn oncoming traffic that their, that their vehicle is right there. So Rutledge attempted to use the same kind of flare to deliberately damage the frame, but could only get the same bubbling effect after prolonged exposure, which would have severely damaged the trucker's face had he been wearing them, as he said. According to doctors, the trucker had not sustained any permanent damage to his face or eyes, although the trucker disputed this and actually said he, um, he was having trouble seeing things. He felt like the, that the, the light had blinded him, you know, given him sort of like flash blinding, and it took him several months to recover. Now, there was something about the situation that didn't add up, so either the trucker was not telling the whole truth, or something very strange had indeed happened to him. Rutledge could not decide. You know, the evidence was kind of weird. So when asked for his opinion by the press, Rutledge said that it was either an unknown situation, and he had been exposed to something, or it was a possible hoax, because what he was saying and the evidence was equivocal, you know, it was difficult to tell. Of course, depending on which headline the media wanted to run, the press took his statement both ways. The mainstream press chose the hoax angle, and Rutledge was quoted as saying that the whole thing was a hoax, and, that this, and then this story was thus used to throw hot water on the entire Piedmont UFO flap entirely, which of course according to, to Rutledge, is not at all what he said nor intended. This was very upsetting to UFO investigators who had been avidly snatching up sensational stories in order to make the 1973 nationwide flap even more spectacular. Even Jacques Vallée issued his opinion about the incident by dissing Rutledge as a confused local scientist who examined the glasses and issued an incorrect opinion because he didn't know the greater context of UFO reports generally. And you can find this quotation on page 16 of the original edition of, or the first edition of Invisible College. And just to give you a little bit of context as to what Jacques Vallée is talking about in, in this chapter in Invisible College, it's the, the chapter that's called the psychic component. Um, it says here, and I'll just read this here. A husband and wife team who drove a truck in the Midwest were fired from their job when they reported that an object had followed them along a Missouri road one October night, emitting a burst of light that blinded the husband, inducing some loss of eyesight, similar to the case of the engineer I have mentioned in the introduction, and caused the plastic frame of his glasses to melt. Like the Pascagoula story of robot monsters, the facts were unbelievable to local scientists who examined them out of, out of the context of the overall phenomenon. In fact, as we understand, Rutledge knew a great deal, not only about the national context of UFO sightings, but the specific local context of them as well. He hadn't been asked to judge about the psychological state of the trucker, nor had he been asked to give any kind of judgment 
about the psychic component of UFOs. He had already begun to experience the communicative aspect of the phenomenon. And he probably had seen more unusual things already than Valet had up to that point. He was doing with potential physical evidence precisely what Valet is trying to do with some traces of so-called physical evidence himself right now. What does one do when prosaic physical objects show traces of something potentially unusual? And Rutledge did indicate that something unusual might have occurred. He just didn't know what it was. So Valet missed an opportunity here. And in retrospect, I think he should probably re-examine this and maybe be a little embarrassed. But then his mentor, um, Dr. Hynek, missed the boat in Piedmont as well. Having Rutledge tell the whole story here is extremely important for it is part of UFO lore that has long been missed and misunderstood. So phase three of project identification can roughly be said to begin in April 1974, a complete year after phase one began, or phase three, yes. Rutledge and project members set up throughout the winter on Nash and Blue Meyer Road as well as from his front yard, whenever the weather permitted. More often than not, they were successful in recording at least one unusual light, strobes or display of pseudostars. He doesn't record in the book every single instance of everything, because apparently there were so many different things that were recorded, um, that for the purposes of the book, he just simply wanted to put the best things and most representative things in. However, Rutledge does say in the book that he just kind of felt, and this is in quotes, that the flap as such would probably slow down considerably by spring. And what I've done here is I've included uh, a couple of pseudo star examples from different time periods. Um, the, the one on the right is a pseudo star incident that occurred um, in, within phase two. And then on the left is a pseudo star incident that occurred in phase three. But this is just to give you an example of pseudo star incidences. And to remind you what a pseudo star incident is or, or sighting is, it's when you, you think you're looking at uh, a constellation that maybe has an extra star in it, or you think you're looking at a planet that suddenly appears in the wrong place, and then all of a sudden the lights change or move and reveal themselves to not be what you thought they were. So in the one on the right, the, they basically were looking at the, the constellation Scorpio. And what they noticed was uh, the, the, three, the three lights that are connected specifically to... Uh, the the lights these three lights here that are sort of at, at that are to the right of Antares these three lights suddenly brightened up and sped sped away I mean the constellation remained but whatever these lights were were perfectly superimposed from our perspective over the lights of the constellations and all of a sudden they brightened and sped away so that's like one example of pseudo stars. Uh, he also mentioned a number of different pseudo star examples or sightings that seem to occur around Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, the, 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 the Big Dipper and the Small Dipper. And this is one illustrated one that, that seemed to occur uh, around the Little Dipper. And it involved two separate things where you have you have a, obviously something superimposed over uh, the the lower right hand the lower right hand corner star of the little dipper and then suddenly it brightens and moves and then during the same time period or the same sighting another light will travel travel towards the dipper and superimposed itself over the 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 furthest star of the handle. And there were all kinds of things that happened like this. Like, for example, you'd be looking at Ursa Major, and all of a sudden, right in the middle of the dipper part, 
of the constellation, there would be this really intense pulse, and then something would shoot away. So uh, pseudo stars were very common, um, and of course, he, he found them to be interesting and unnerving, as I've mentioned, in equal measure. Still, Rutledge and project members tracked unusual sightings through 1974. By the end of that year, all of Rutledge's children had personally witnessed at least one strange unidentified light from the vantage point of their front yard. Many of the project members had to go on to other parts of their lives, but Rutledge felt there was still enough happening to warrant his purchase of some better equipment to keep at home, and so he did. So Pro Rutledge lists the years of 1975 to 1980 as the time of accidental sightings, by which he means sightings which occurred spontaneously and not during a planned observation. It was during this five-year period that some of his most significant experiences occurred, although the sightings in general were far less frequent, and he also went out in the field less. You know, he was the chair of a department, he had all kinds of committees to be on, his kids were getting a little bit older, um, and you know, he had life to live, he had things to do, so he just could not go out into the field like he had. In January of 1975, he doesn't have an exact date, both he and his wife saw a glowing disc-shaped object near their home as they were returning from errands. And this is uh, the graphic that I have here on the left-hand side, if you're looking at the video. Although they both saw a disc shape, the details were different. Um, and in fact, I believe, if I recall, that, um, that his wife Ruth actually saw more of a, of a light coming directly from the dome. So there was a little bit of color differentiation on the disc itself. Rutledge's son, Mark, began to accompany him and other project members into the field because of a sighting he had had with his father in their, uh, in their, back, in their front yard, he, and he started to have sightings on his own occasionally. In August of 1976, while visiting family in Rutledge, Rutledge, <laughs> boy, I tell you, in August of 1976, while visiting family in Iowa, Rutledge discovered that the phenomena had seemingly followed him to his parents' home. Less than a month later, he watched from his college office window as a silver disc in broad daylight shot into the sky and disappeared. And that's the graphic that you see here. This is the drawing that he made of that. So according to him, basically, um, he was just resting his eyes he had been doing some desk work. He was resting his eyes. He pushed back from his desk and just looked outside, you know, to just sort of, you know, what you do to kind of clear your head. And, and at some distance, but relatively close to his, his uh, office window, there was this dish, disc shape, and it was almost as if it was just waiting for him to see it. And as soon as he saw it and could focus on it, it shot away and disappeared. By 1978, Mark Rutledge had had several of his own sightings, as I mentioned, from the front yard. And it was during this latter period that the Rutledge family and several project members experienced what we are familiar with as the fear, action, fear reaction, that uncanny valley feeling when something seems to fly overhead but one cannot see anything. In fact, this happened several times where they'd be out looking with you know, diff with several people together, and then it, it would be as if something dark, you know, something that they they actually saw this a few times, but you can't really film it. Something that seemed a lar something large that seemed to blot out the sun or blot blot out the sun, blot out the stars, and just go by in the sky, and it kind of fills you with a sense of dread. Ruth. Rutledge's wife in particular seems to have had this experience strongly several times, this kind of unnerving uh, sense of fear that just sort of grabs you. This has been reported a number of times in other places. John Keel reports this. Um, they report this in, in Pine Bush. I experienced this in Pine Bush at one point when I went there. So I, I, I understand what that feeling is. It's just this feeling of kind of weird dread that just seems to sort of 
suddenly take you and everything seems darker. It's, very, it's a very uncanny, bizarre experience. 1979 was the last full year of project identification, and it was also the year that the phenomenon demonstrated that it could and would react to most members of the Rutledge family if they observed it from their home. Essentially, by 1979, not only had every family member had some kind of sighting, but they had had some kind of interaction with the phenomenon. It was almost as if it had become a part of them. Now, the last sighting recorded in the book, and this is what Rutledge actually says. He says, this is the last th right sighting I'm going to record here in the book. It's like he has to end it somewhere because he clearly anticipates that the sightings will continue periodically. And these were reddish strobes that occurred close to his house on November 9th, 1979. And as he puts it, I watch and I wait. So the project officially closed in January 1980, and he began to correlate his data, which constitutes the remainder of the book. And then the text project identification was published in 1981. So Rutledge's remaining chapters are valuable data entries in the field of ufology that few have bothered to plumb, apply, or really reckon with. He produces a map, which I have duplicated here, which breaks down the total of UFOs seen by project members by location over time. His statistics show that most unidentified sightings occurred at dusk and then later on at night. There would be, there'd be um, things at dusk and there'd, there'd be a break and then there'd be later, later sightings at night, usually after 9.30 or so, up until about midnight. And a, very, a pattern very similar to that uh, occurred at Pine Bush during the height of display there in the 1990s. I want to just take a little bit of time for those of you who are actually looking at the video to look at this diagram that he includes. So if you go to the Piedmont area, for example, you'll find that there were 27 sightings or observer s uh, stations that were um, set up uh, where sightings occurred. Um, of 27 sightings of 38 UFOs, uh, five of which were Class A, 22 of which were Class B. Fredericktown and Farmington, this area here, you have 18 sightings of 20 UFOs, six of which were Class A, 12 of which were Class B. He has one in, in Perryville. Cape Girardeau, you have 104 sightings. Um, of 112 UFOs, 21 of which were Class A, 83 of which were Class B. Sykeston, this is another area um, where they had six sightings of seven UFOs, one of which was Class A, five of which were Class B. They also uh, set up observation points in Chaffee and some other areas around here, uh, but these were the main areas where they got the best information. A statistical breakdown shows that most objects or lights also displayed on Thursday and Friday rather than Wednesday, as some other experts, such as Keel following Amy Michel, had indicated. Rutledge had come to the conclusion that lots of phenomena were probably always flying around in the sky, but most humans didn't look up to see it. The lights and objects exhibited a wide range of colors, shapes, sizes, and behaviors all of which he breaks down, although he has explanations for none of it. He also speculated on the possible reasons for why the Piedmont area had become a display region. One explanation I hadn't thought of that he mentions is that at least at the time, and this of course is the late 70s, the entirety of southeast Missouri was kind of a radar black hole. Local airports used Kansas City, St. Louis, or Memphis radar systems, which overlapped at the edge of their respective ranges, right in the Piedmont to Cape Girardeau corridor. Now, Rutledge had noticed that the lights seemed to try to avoid planes, blinking out as they approached and then blinking back on again. In such a radar poor area, it would also be easier for the military to conduct activities, including their own equipment tests and investigations, without registering on FAA radar posts. Now, I'm sure the situation has changed in the intervening years, but it certainly is an idea I hadn't thought of. 
in terms of why Southeast Missouri, why at that time. Now, in the end, it was the behavior of the objects or lights that shocked Rutledge more than anything else. With project identification, Rutledge hoped to prove something definitive about UFOs. If nothing else, they are worth studying on their own merit. In the end, as he became convinced that they responded to human activity and even human thoughts in ways that could not be coincidence, he realized that he was dealing with the deepest of mysteries. The only thing he could come up with was that they acted like a feedback system composed of intelligently and remotely controlled plasmas. And that was just simply his description of like how they acted and what they looked like. Um, given what Keel and Valet has surmised, this is probably just about as good as they have ever gotten. To what end that feedback system might exist, Rutledge had no idea. Now, very little of what has been described in these blog posts about the Piedmont UFO display is unknown to regular field observers or UFOs. The point is that project identification attempted to actually intercept, record, and measure these phenomena. And to some degree, the team accomplished their task. Instruments did record discrete unknown or unusual lights or objects approaching observers. They measured their speed, they measured their altitude, they measured their distance. This is not pretend or pretense. This is in fact the basis of all science. Curiosity, measurement, attempted hypothesis, more observation as needed, ad infinitum. Will we or can we follow in their footsteps? Now, I ended the Pine Bush chapter in Mysterious Beauty with the passage that concludes the official findings of project identification. But before I do that, I want to, for those of you who are just listening and, and not actually looking, I want to um, read a quote by Harley Rutledge as it was conveyed or from the archived in the field report by Scott Brown, as I saw it on Paranormal X-Files. This was from an interview that he gave. And he says, on many occasions when the lights came toward us and we attempted to photograph them, they turned away or switched off. In cases where we saw hovering lights, they have flown away when we approached aerially or otherwise indicated we knew of their presence. There is something out there. I don't want to scare anyone. And the one way not to do that is by trying to explain these phenomena. So, I mean, this is a classic scientist's approach. He understands there is a human element to that, this, and he understands that there is some kind of an interaction that is occurring between observer and observed. And he's just trying to figure this out. So it is still good to quote here what I ended the Pine Bush chapter in Mysterious Beauty with, this certain passage. Keeping in mind that Harley Rutledge was a man trained in science, seeking rational explanations for the mysteries of the world around him. So this is how I, I ended my chapter on Pine Bush by quoting the end of the official document of project identification by Harley Rutledge. Quote, in this research, more was involved than the measurement of physical properties of UFOs by dispassionate observers. A relationship, a cognizance between us and the UFO intelligence evolved. A game was played. In my opinion, this additional consideration is more important than the measurements of establishing that the phenomenon exists. This facet of the UFO phenomenon perturbed me as much as the advanced technology that we observed. It is a facet I cannot really fathom, and I have thought about it every day for more than seven years. And this is the end of the Project Identification Trilogy.